Hello, everybody, and welcome to this evening's Trouble Begins. Um, I'm so happy to welcome you tonight. Um, I'm joined by John Pascal, and it is, it's going to be a fabulous presentation. I just know it. Um, so before we get started, to introduce myself as always, I am Jody DeBrine, the Director of Collections at the Mark Twain House and Museum. Um, I'll be doing the admin information tonight, and I'll be back for the Q&A a little later. Um, I first have to thank our wonderful sponsors. Um, the Trouble Begin series is brought, um, made possible by Connecticut Humanities, as well as the Center for uh, Mark Twain Studies in Elmira, New York. Um, so thank you so much to them for making this uh, tonight happen and all of the Trouble Begins um, this past year and into next spring. Um, if you want to support us at the Mark Twain House, um, every dollar counts at the moment um, between COVID and everything else we're facing. Um, so if you want to support programming like this and everything else we do, um, there is a kind of a green button at the bottom of your screen that says uh, your support is vital to the Mark Twain House and Museum. Please donate here. Uh, please click that button and be, give whatever you're able to, whether it's a dollar, five dollars, ten dollars, way more dollars. Um, we appreciate every single cent that comes to us right now. Um, as always, there is a chat feature on the side of your screen. Um, lots of people are already uh, you know, singing their praise for John in there, and that's wonderful to see. Um, please feel free to chat amongst yourselves during the program in that feature. But if you have a question for John, please use the ask a question feature that's at the very bottom of your screen. Um, right next to the chat feature, there should be a people count and then that ask a question. Um, at the end of the program, I'll pop back on and uh, ask John everything that you want to know. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to John and let him introduce himself and then start his wonderful lecture. So John, all yours. Thank you very much, Jody. And it's an honor to be here and part of the Trouble Begins at 530 lecture series. Let's get started with this team boat. Can everybody I see our hero? I can see him and I can hear him. So I'm hoping everybody else can too. Fantastic. I think you're good to go, John. Thank you. Artemis Ward, the gentle humorist and his lecture influence on Mark Twain. It is generally accepted that during his lifetime, Mark Twain was considered the preeminent American master storyteller and lecturer of humor. But the tsunami that is Twain's literary achievement can easily overwhelm the earlier vast movement of the American literary scene that led to its creation. The underwater earthquake of this movement is Charles Farrar Brown, but his more famous pseudonym is Artemis Ward. While there were earlier as well as contemporary humorous writers, Artemis Ward was regarded by William Dean Howells as, quote, the humorist who first gave the world a taste of the humor that characterizes the whole American people, unquote. In his 1871 lecture, Mark Twain said that Ward was, quote, America's greatest humorist, no manufactured humorist, humor was born in him, unquote. His uniqueness in telling a story from the stage in deliberate burlesques of the informative lecture enthralled tens of thousands throughout the United States and in Canada. He was also the first deadpan comedian to take England by storm. Today, Ward's literary reputation is largely forgotten. Yet he was distinctively influential in the American tradition of his day and so is deserving of study. What made Ward so popular was that his literary humor was rhetorically gentle. At the door of the tent, ladies and gentlemen, the show is about to commence. You could not well expect to go in without paying, but you may pay without going in. I can say no fairer than that. This is seen through his numerous fictitious letters 
to the Cleveland Daily Plain Dealer and Vanity Fair, which were reprinted throughout our country. The success of his humorous letters was displayed in a character that exuded confidence without conceit and whose observations of contemporary issues contain neither sarcasm nor malice. His satiric wit was enjoyed by all of its targets. Furthermore, Artemis Ward was the first printer and journalist to parlay the success of his nationally published letters into a commercially successful career as the first comedic lecturer to tour our nation. In his time, Ward achieved a fascinating dichotomy with his genial humor. His letters to the plain dealer showed a very confident, middle-aged, pot-bellied, P.T. Barnum-like character from a traveling tent show of unusual animals and wax figures who used humorous spellings then in vogue to intelligently and reflectively comment on a variety of contemporary national topics, such as politics, the Civil War, reform movements, cults, and various human weaknesses. Sound familiar? However, his lectures billed as Artemis Ward Speaks a Peace startled audiences that saw instead the real Charles Farrar Brown, a gaunt young man of 27 who dressed quite distinguishingly and spoke very formally in a humorous stream of consciousness with a seriousness of expression. His lecture techniques are reasons for the commercial success of his humor. Ward's natural sense of ascetic humor was closely allied with his extraordinary rapport with his lecture audiences. His success as a lecturer included the deliberate uses of mock gravity, the look of innocent surprise when the audience laughed, the anticlimaxes, pauses, non sequiturs, and wanderings of thought, which delighted his spectators everywhere. Also, he altered his natural humor for successful appearances on the lecture circuit through deliberate and methodical preparation in delivery. Lastly, Ward's distinctive lecture style directly influenced the lecture style of Mark Twain. Ward's platform appearances helped Twain become more professionally aware of humor's literary and commercial value. His lecture methodology presented Twain with a living example of success within his own capabilities. Twain's own lectures and his comments on his lecturing techniques were clearly patterned on Ward's, an approach that helped Twain to deliver nearly a thousand lectures and speeches throughout the United States and abroad. Indeed, Twain's 1895 essay, How to Tell a Story, gives evidence of his acknowledgement of the influence of Ward's lecture skills. Ward himself gave almost no explanatory quotes to give a clear picture of his virtues and talents. This is another reason why his humor should not be forgotten. In stating a sense of morals through humor, what Ward did say is that humorous writers have always, quote, born battle for the right with its grave truth fully in mind with an artillery of wit that has silenced the heavy batteries of formal discussion. They have helped the truth along without encumbering it with themselves. In this battle, the writers have always done the most toward aiding virtue on its pilgrimage, and the truth has found more aid from them than all the grave polemists and solid writers that have ever spoken or written. And he also said this, I hope I have a right to say that I have always meant the creatures of my burlesques should stab error and give light a friendly push. He was born Charles Farrar Brown in Waterford, Oxford County, Maine, on April 26, 1834, and died from tuberculosis while on his lecture tour in Southampton, England, on March 7, 1867. As a youth, 
He attended school and loved public speaking, but felt that he had, quote, about enough education for a signboard, unquote. He enjoyed minstrel shows, traveling shows, and circuses far more. In his 1871 lecture, Twain tells that as a schoolboy, Brown got hold of a pack of playing cards. A Baptist minister was stopping by the house and to hide the cards, Brown placed them in the minister's black gown, which hung in a closet. But what was his horror to see the minister one day in the river, baptizing his converts, and presently the cards commenced to float upon the water, the first cards being a pair of queens and three aces. Well, he got walloped for this, and his aunt pictured to him the humiliation of the minister. Said she, I don't see how he got out of it. Artemis replied, I don't see how he could help going out with a hand like that. Brown was 13 when his father's death caused him to become an itinerant printer. Sound familiar? He was employed at several newspapers and printing offices in rural New England. In 1851, he became a compositor for three years at Boston's Carpet Bag. And it was here that he met several influences that developed his art. The Carpet Bag was a weekly comic magazine edited by Benjamin Penhallow Shillaber. What a name, Benjamin Penhallow Shillaber, who held that its purpose was to promote cheerfulness among its readers. Brown adopted this philosophy of humor. The manager of his later lecture tours, Edward P. Hingston, wrote of Brown that, quote, to make people laugh was to be his primary endeavor. He believed in laughter as thoroughly wholesome. He had the firmest conviction that fun is healthy and sportiveness the truest sign of sanity, unquote. While putting many of their works in type and thus studying them word for word, Brown became familiar with a wide range of American humorists. Their type of humor was typically a rustic, uneducated person's comments on life, especially town life. And so Brown began his career in the down east humor that came from Maine and moved throughout New England. This backwoods Yankees views were enjoyed because not only did he accurately ridicule the given situation, but also his own lack of schooling showed in his atrocious spelling, which was part of the humor. The carpet bag folded in 1853. Brown then traveled across Massachusetts, New York, Pennsylvania, and finally became an editor for Ohio's Toledo Commercial. Brown's writing quality eventually got him hired as a commercial editor for the Cleveland Daily Plain Dealer in 1857, and he was promoted to city editor in 1858. On January 30th, 1858, in an effort to liven up and fill space in his local reporting column of various civic happenings, Brown began to write letters to this paper in the persona of Artemis Ward, an illiterate but shrewd Yankee showman traveling with a wax museum. With a name taken from his imagination, Brown created this traveling showman who is, quote, anxious to exhibit wax works, tame bears, and a kangaroo, and is apparently approaching nearer and nearer to the city, looking for free promotion, unquote. You can see Artemis Ward to the right, looking in at his creation with his wife, fictional wife, Betsy. This is his first letter, January 30th, 1858. One of Ward's, Mr. Ward's business letters. To the editor of the, sir, I'm moving along, slowly along, down towards your place. I want you should write me a letter saying how is the show business in your place? My show at present consists of three moral bears, a kangaroo, an amusing little rascal, twould make you laugh yourself to death to see the little cuss jump up and squeal, wax figures of G. Washington, General Taylor, John Bunyan, Captain Kidd, and Dr. Webster in the act of killing Dr. Parkman, 
besides several miscellaneous moral wax statutes of celebrated pirates and murderers and such, equaled by few and excelled by none. Now, Mr. Editor, scratch off a few lines saying, how is the show business in your place? I shall have my handbills done at your office. Depend upon it. I want you should get my handbills up in flame and style. Also get up a tremendous excitement in your paper about my unparalleled show. We must fetch the public somehow. We must work on their feelings. Come the moral on them strong. If it's a temperance community, tell them I signed the pledge 15 minutes after I was born. But on the contrary, if your people take their tods, say Mr. Ward is as genial a fella as we ever met, full of conviviality and the life and soul of the social board. Take, don't you? If you say anything about my show, say my snakes is as harmless as the newborn babe. What an interesting study it is to see a zoological animal like a snake under perfect subjection. My kangaroo is the most laughable little cuss I ever saw, all for 15 cents. I am anxious to skewer your influence. I repeat in regard to them handbills that I shall get them struck off up in your printing office. My political sentiments agree with yourn exactly. I know they do because I never saw a man who's didn't. Respectively yours, A. Ward. P.S. You scratch my back and I'll scratch your back. Brown's letters caught the attention and appreciation of his readers. Through the policy of free exchange, newspapers throughout our country began to reprint his letters and they became the basis of his literary work. As his reputation grew, Brown became known simply as Artemis Ward. By the time he left Cleveland for New York City in late 1860 to work for Vanity Fair, eventually becoming its editor, his letters had earned him a national reputation. There are two reasons for this. The first is that he dealt with national problems such as the draft, secession, the Civil War, Congress, patronage, Lincoln, and contemporary religious groups as the Mormons, the Shakers, and the Spiritualists. On highly controversial issues, Brown placed Ward almost always to be on the side of the majority of his readers. Seldom did he risk their loss by attacking a popular belief, and when he did, he employed his gentle humor. Secondly, while they are addressed to the local editor of The Plain Dealer, the character enjoys a wider reputation in the nation because the letters come from different points in the Middle West and from a native of Baldensville, Indiana, with, quote, wide experience on the frontier, unquote. He became Vanity Fair's editor in 1861, and in 1862, when some of his letters were collected into a book entitled Artemis Ward, his book, 40,000 copies were sold outright. Its most public boost coming from its most public admirer, Abraham Lincoln. During his lifetime, as I said, Ward wrote in 1862, Artemis Ward, his book. In 1865, Artemis Ward, his travels. Posthumously, his executors published three works, Artemis Ward in London and other papers, 1867. In 1869, Artemis Ward's Panorama, as exhibited at the Egyptian Hall, London. And lastly, in 1898, the complete works of Artemis Ward. The most accessible public entertainment in the America of the 1850s was the popular lecture, an outgrowth of the Lyceum movement of the 1830s and 1840s. Now, sensing that the Lyceum public was ready for a playful burlesque of the serious lecturer, Brown's success with his letters led to his decision to become Artemis Ward upon the lecture platform. Stringing together random thoughts from his letters under the title, The Babes in the Wood, he gave his first lecture in Connecticut in late 1861. He appeared successfully throughout New England and then lectured in New York City in that same year. 
To his audience's surprise and delight, he did not appear as the physical personification of the Artemis Ward letters. Instead, they saw the formally and immaculately dressed young Charles Farrar Brown speaking diversely on various topics with deadpan manner commenting on life's shortcomings with subdued humor. Again, sound familiar? Brown was successful because he intuitively decided in what form he would appear before the public. While America did have entertainers who used facial changes or unusual costumes to entertain their audience, there was no one who ventured to joke for an hour before a house full of people with no aid from scenery or dress. Due to his tall, thin, and lanky frame, coupled with an eagle-like nose and a mustache covering his mouth, Brown knew that it was impractical to use facial expressions for humor and that it was unrealistic to actually appear as a showman with harmless snakes and trained kangaroos. So he created a lecture that should contain the smallest possible amount of information with the greatest quality of fun. He gathered all his best jokes, quips and cranks, and invented new drolleries on social and political topics of the day. He collected quaint thoughts, whimsical fantasies, bizarre notions, and ludicrous anecdotes, and tied them all together without relevancy or connection. This string of jests was combined with a stream of satire, the whole being as unconnected and one jest having as little relation to another as the articles in any number of a comic periodical. In preparation and delivery, Brown consistently planned and rehearsed every word. A line, he once said, if you can hit the right thing, will give as good an idea of a place as whole pages. He also said this, there is no wit in the form of a well-rounded sentence. If I say, Alexander the Great conquered the world and then sighed, because he could not do so some more, there is a funny mixture. In October of 1863, he made a rare comment on his lecture piece of a style that Twain would pick up. He said, quote, the great merit is that it contains so many things that do not have anything to do with it, unquote. Perhaps Jerry Seinfeld owes a thank you to Mark Twain and back to Artemis Ward. As his fame spread, Brown gave lectures in California, Nevada, Salt Lake City, Denver, and throughout the Eastern States and Canada. Another unique advertising success was his humorous alteration of the program pamphlet itself. Every night except Saturday at eight, Saturday mornings at three, during the vacation, the hall has been carefully swept out and a new doorknob has been added to the door. Mr. Artemis Ward will call on the citizens of London at their residences and explain any jokes in his narratives which they may not understand. Another pamphlet, a bit of personal statistics. In the middle, traveler, how long was Artemis Ward in California? Five feet, ten and a half. He also put on his pamphlets and on posters, doors open at 6, show begins at 3 a.m. Mark Twain will say, doors open at 6, the trouble begins at 8. Sound familiar? The program was an intentional satire of the little pamphlets that usually sold for 15 or 20 cents and which listed the cast of the show, describing the outstanding scenes and reprinted favorable reviews from newspapers. Brown's program listed the members of his company as a crankist who managed the panoramas movement, a moppist, a door tendist, and the others, with Ward himself listed as a gas man. If I can just jump back, the rules of the house, children in arms not admitted if the arms are loaded, Children under one year of age not admitted unless accompanied by their parents or guardians. Ladies or gentlemen, will please report any negligence or disobedience on the part of the lecturer. 
Artemis Ward will not be responsible for money, jewelry, or other valuables, unless left with him to be returned in a week or so. Persons who think they will enjoy themselves more by leaving the hall early in the evening are requested to do so with as little noise as possible. One of the most humorous of newspaper endorsement parodies was the following. Quote, it was a grand scene. Mr. Artemis Ward standing on the platform, talking, many of the audience sleeping tranquilly in their seats, others leaving the room and not returning, others crying like a child at some of the jokes. All, all formed a most impressive scene and showed the powers of this remarkable orator. And when he announced that he should never lecture in that town again, the applause was absolutely deafening. Everyone within the space of roughly five years, this literary comedian absorbed and used many types of American humor to the delight of his regional audiences. Well, how did he do that? In the mid-1860s, there were few men compared with Ward who had attained a better grasp of what America looked like, what America felt, and what America thought simply because he traveled. He had known the forests in Maine, walked up Beacon Hill and down Broadway, and lectured to California and back. He worked near Lake Erie's shores and extensively toured the gold fields, seen terrain as disparate as the Sierras and Savannas, crossed the Rockies and down the coast and along the Ohio and Mississippi. With the exception of the Southwest, he had, in fact, been practically everywhere by steamboat, train, canal boat, and stagecoach, and even on foot. He'd been in big towns and small ones, heard the big talk and the small talk. He'd known the greats like Mark Twain and Walt Whitman, and thousands, thousands of never heard ofs farmers, lumbermen, miners boarding house landladies, bartenders, cavalrymen, boatmen, railway conductors, show people, gamblers, storekeepers, Yankees, Indians, Swedes, Germans, blacks, Irishmen, all kinds of people and all going by the name American. But if the fame seemed at times to consume him, he always brought himself back to reality by visiting the local print shop wherever he toured. After five seasons of lecturing, he went to England at the top of his performing career in June, 1866. He was invited and gladly contributed Artemis Ward letters to London's Punch Magazine. Beginning in early November, 1866, Brown filled the Egyptian Hall in Piccadilly with his lecture and accompanying panorama and pianist. He was the first lecturer to use a comic panorama of visual subjects for a continuing stream of digressions in his lecture on the Mormons. Please look at this panorama. He will say in front of it, the prairie on fire. A prairie on fire is one of the wildest and grandest sights that can possibly, that can be possibly imagined. These fires occur, of course, in the summer when the grass is dry as tinder, and the flames rush and roar over the prairie in a manner frightful to behold. Well, as he's looking at the audience, behind him, the panorama is actually catching on fire, and the people are trying to warn him, but he's ignoring them. He deliberately had somebody set it on fire at the right moment, and then he turns around and the audience is howling. And he will say, they usually burn brighter, better than mine is burning tonight. I try to make my prairie burn regularly and not disappoint the public. But it is not as high principled as I am. The plains of Nebraska, it doesn't look very inviting for some Expedia rewards. And he will say, the plains of Nebraska, these are the dreary plains over which we rode for so many weary days. An affecting incident occurred on these plains sometime since. 
and I'm sure you will pardon me for mentioning it. And then what does he do? He will say on a beautiful June morning some 16 years ago, and then the pianist will start playing, and he will try to tell the pianist to stop playing, and the audience is laughing. What they don't understand is that he planned this deliberately. He's trying to tell a story. The pianist keeps playing, and finally the pianist stops. No one has heard what he said, and his last words are from 16 years ago, and she fainted on Reginald's breast. By late January, 1867, sadly, Brown was too ill with tuberculosis to continue his lectures. Unable to recuperate, he died just short of his 33rd birthday. The strength of his good humor served a greater end for his fellow citizen. And it is that if in making them laugh, he could also cause them to see through a sham, be ashamed of some silly national prejudice or suspicious of the value of some current piece of political bunkum, so much the better. Brown was the first literary comedian to bring American humor to a national prestige of respect on the lecture circuit in this country and finally in England. While successfully raising the nation's awareness on the importance and power of humor, he stimulated his readers and audiences imagination in reflection of the country's social and political topics. He was instrumental in getting Twain's story, Jim Smiley and His Jumping Frog, published in the East, its success beginning Twain's rise to fame. And seeing Brown as Ward on stage awakened Twain to the possibilities of pursuing humorous writing and speaking professionally. Moreover, Twain adopted a similar lecture style to that of Brown's as he delivered nearly a thousand lectures throughout the world in his career. In late December of 1863, Brown arrived in Nevada's Virginia City. He gave his Babes in the Wood lecture in McGuire's Opera House. Jared Graham, a printer and journalist for the Virginia City Union, was present and noted that the lecture was a continuous string of grotesque and absurd witticisms so keen and dry and far-fetched that for a moment, no one could see a point. And each time a laugh was due, the lecturer would pause until it came. With the first guffaw, the audience seemed to catch on, and then it would go off like a corn popper. Everyone seated in the printer's pew, reserved for newspaper men, Graham sat next to and observed Samuel Langhorne Clemens, now writing as Mark Twain, who was sent from the Territorial Enterprise to cover the lecture. He saw that Twain watched with his mouth wide open for the entire length of the lecture. And after each general uproar of laughter had subsided, Twain would emit a spasmodic ha 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 unreserved, as if from a burrow corral. This would attract all eyes to the pew. And at each interruption, Artemis paused again and glaring in mock anger said, has it been watered today? Additionally saying, you must now all admit the truth of the old saw that he who laughs, last laughs best. And Twain wrote this, there are perhaps 50 subjects treated in it, and there is a passable point in every one of them, and a hearty laugh also for any of God's creatures who have committed no crime, the ghastly memory of which debars him from smiling again while he lives. The man who is capable of listening to the babes in the woods from beginning to end without laughing, either inwardly or outwardly, must have done murder, or at least meditated it, at some point during his life. In his essay, Platform Readings, dated October 10th, 1907, Twain lists the techniques of the lecturer, such as fictitious hesitancies for the right word, fictitious unconscious pauses, fictitious unconscious side remarks, fictitious unconscious embarrassments, fictitious unconscious emphases placed upon the wrong word 
with a deep intention back of it. These and all the other artful, fictive shades which give to a recited tale the captivating naturalness of an impromptu narration. Yet Brown had already developed and demonstrated these qualities. Despite a brief exposure to Brown's oral techniques, particularly the pose of comic innocence, Twain received a permanently lasting impression. Brown's oral platform manner inspired Twain's own approach to his audiences when he began his lecture tours. Twain borrowed phrasings and ideas and imitated devices like tangled syntax and pseudo seriousness. Brown's platform manner had a deceptive artlessness. His seriousness so muffled the point of a joke that an audience did not break into laughter until he had gone on. Then he paused, looking surprised and hurt at the unseemly interruption. Mark Twain as a lecturer used exactly the same tactics, with both the manner of delivery being more important than the material. In How to Tell a Story, Twain's views are that the humorous story is distinctly American and, quote, depends for its effect upon the manner of telling, not upon the subject matter itself, unquote. Comparisons between these two individuals were frequent. In the November 10th, 1866 edition of the Calaveras Chronicle, a correspondent called Mark Twain, quote, the celebrated Artemis Ward of the Pacific Coast, unquote. The tour of 1868-1869 was Twain's most important tour for his career as a public lecturer because it was his first extensive one and lasted an entire lecture season. The subject was the American Vandal Abroad. Twain was compared to Brown in his slow, quaint way of saying things. Like Brown, Twain's dry, deadpan humor, with the fun invariably coming in at the end of a sentence after a pause, was part of his manner of speech. When audiences realized they were not to be bored from the slow, drawling speech, the dry humor, and the deadpan face, they delightedly took in every word. The tour was such a success that several newspapers reported that Twain, quote, was the most popular American humorist since Artemis Ward, unquote. While Brown had given him a clear path to follow in lecturing, Twain now knew that he could be his own unique self on the platform and that he could follow his own genius as a public lecturer. Once again, in How to Tell a Story, Twain shows the strong influence of Brown's deadpan by writing that, quote, a humorous story is told gravely. The teller does his best to conceal the fact that he even dimly suspects there is anything funny about it, unquote. This is preferable to a comic storyteller telling his audience they are about to hear one of the funniest things he has ever heard and is the first one to laugh when he completes the story. For Mark Twain as a lecturer, this is sad to see. Twain prefers the rambling and disjointed, uh, disjointed humorous story that finishes with a nub, point, snapper, or whatever you like to call it. Then the listener must be alert, for in many cases the teller will divert attention from that nub by dropping it in a carefully casual and indifferent way, with the pretense that he does not know it is a nub. Twain acknowledges in this essay that Brown used this trick, quote, a good deal. Then when the belated audience presently caught the joke, he would look up with innocent surprise, as if wondering what they had found to laugh at, unquote. For Mark Twain, the foundation of American art is to string incongruities and absurdities together in a wandering and sometimes purposeless way and seem innocently unaware that they are absurdities. Another feature is the slurring point. A third is the dropping of a studied remark apparently without knowing it, as if one were thinking aloud. The fourth and last is the pause. Again, Twain gives credit in his essay to Brown by writing that, quote, Artemis Ward dealt in numbers three and four a good deal. He would begin to tell with great animation something which he seemed to think was wonderful, then lose confidence 
and after an apparently absent-minded pause, add an incongruous remark in a soliloquizing way. And that was the remark intended to explode the mind. And it did. Twain gives an example of Brown's style. Brown would say with eager excitement, I want to know a man in New Zealand who added a tooth in his head. Here the animation would die out. A silent reflective pause would follow. Then he would say dreamily, as if to himself, and yet that man could beat a drum better than any man I ever saw. Twain gives special attention to the pause. For Twain, quote, it is an exceedingly important feature in any kind of story and a frequently recurring feature too. It is a dainty thing and delicate and also uncertain and treacherous for it must be exactly the right length, no more and no less, or it fails of its purpose and makes trouble. If the pause is too short, the impressive point is passed and the audience have had time to divine that a surprise is intended, and then you can't surprise them, of course, unquote. Like Brown, Twain also memorized his lectures. Twain emphasized that a lecture delivery from memory or reciting was a standard procedure on the lecture circuit. Thus, Twain could more easily draw out a yarn and thus create a deceptive sense of spontaneity. Its purpose was to, was to promote self-confidence and poise, and enable the speaker to control the audience. Even a primitive storyteller can control his audience. And this is exactly what Charles Farrar Brown as Artemis Ward and Mark Twain did. Brown was the greatest influence on Twain in his lecturing style. Together, they told stories which made fun of pompous speeches on morality, religion, and travel. Both men saw an incongruity between the expected high culture these lectures presumed and the unexpected or low common life they saw, which had tenuous links to virtue and sophistication. To say that Twain's career eclipsed that of Brown's is an obvious fact, but it can be fairly claimed that Brown was an important and forgotten impetus to Mark Twain. In terms of studied spontaneity of platform delivery, the vernacular or inspired idiot persona, the new newspaper humor, and the satire of the enervated genteel society as expressed in its Lyceum lectures, Twain learned a great deal about the business of oral humorous storytelling from Charles Farrar Brown. Remembering Brown's accomplishments and his persona of Artemis Ward, best pays our debt of appreciation of Mark Twain's lectures and literature. And I thank you for your wonderful attention. That was so wonderful. Oh my goodness. I learned so much and we have questions rolling in. Um, so sorry about my cat. <laughs> Uh, um, <laughs> if, as Mark Twain said, if man were crossed with a cat, it would be a distinct improvement for the cat, but a deterioration, a distinct improvement for man, but a deterioration of the cat. Yep. Yep. She joins me for most of these, but most of the time she hops off camera before I get back on. So, um, great. Oh, it was so wonderful. We're getting so much, you are getting so much praise in the, in the chat. So, um, we'll start off with a couple of the questions that have uh, multiple votes here. So the first one from Bill Witt says, curious to know what topics were, oops, sorry, they moved, uh, ventured to differ from the majority of his supporters' fans. For example, did he express personal views on slavery or secession? I don't know the answer to that. As okay. Mark Twain <laughs> confidently say, I don't know. He was always the newspaper reporter, reporting down the middle, not to alienate any of his readers. He was in favor of the union, keeping it together. That's the truth, that much I can say. Great. Um, so our mutual friend and the assistant curator at the Mark Twain House and Museum, Mallory Howard, has asked, um, well, first she says that you're amazing as always, but 
Her Super question fun. is, um, if you were having dinner with Twain and Ward and could ask them only one question, what would you ask them? And also, if you can invite an additional dinner guest, who would it be and why? I'm just going to take these off because mm -hmm. when I speak, there's an echo. Yep. It threw me off in a little bit. Can everybody still hear me? Yes. Okay. I would say to Artemis Ward, as Twain's career is like Hallie's Comet, only going straight up, because he's going for the laugh, but he's also talking about mm -hmm. satire and educating us on the failings of the human condition. And he's becoming more famous than you. Would you have graciously stepped out of the way and let him go? And then I would have said to Mark Twain, do you have any shame that you took from him? And would you have wanted to tour with him? Or would you wanted to have gone on your own? And if I could invite a third person, it would be Stanford University's chair of the English department, Dr. Shelley Fisher Fishkin. I'd want her right there taking it all in and then getting her viewpoints on Artemis Ward and uh, our hero, Mark Twain. That's, that's so great. Um, so wonderful. Um, the questions keep moving. And so I'm making sure that I'm, I'm seeing what they are. Um, so the next question that also has three votes is again from a mutual friend of ours, Steve Courtney. Um, he asked, did Clemens make any comment when Ward died? There's an article that he gave to a newspaper saying he did speak with him when he was sick with tuberculosis. And Ward had said to him, I'm going to give up this mountebank business at some point, And I'm going to do something serious. I'm going to write a novel. And Ward had told a friend when he was in England that he hoped to tour Europe. He is popular today in Australia, but he wanted to come back into the United States, give up lecturing and start writing seriously. So it is very poignant that Twain was right behind him. We don't know what would have happened. The subject, unfortunately, is academically closed. I can say that when Ward's body was brought back from England into New York Harbor, May 1867, there was a ship right next to it, the Quaker City. And Mark Twain will be on that in one month. So their paths crossed one more time. That's really interesting, especially about the Quaker City. I mean, that's such an influential like turning point for, for Mark Twain and, and Innocents Abroad and, you know, leading to his, his meeting Livy and everything. So that's, that's really cool that there's that connection between Ward and him with that as well. Um, all right, so more questions here. Uh, did President Lincoln make any public comments about Ward? He, after the Battle of Antietam, which was, I believe, in the fall of 1862, the smoke, Civil War smoke battle is still surrounding the White House. He called his staff into his Oval Office, if you will, and he, they found him reading Artemis Ward's first book, and he said, let me read you something. And he reads one of the letters. And they're all looking at him amazed. This is a war. This war isn't going to end immediately. And he looks at them and he said, you didn't think that was funny? Well, let me read you another one. He reads it and he's laughing his head off. And the Secretary of War, Edwin Stanton, is ready to walk out. And Abraham Lincoln said, laughter is the best medicine. And you need this as much as I do. And with that... He pulls from the brim of his hat a copy of the a draft of the Emancipation Proclamation, and he reads it to them. And Stanton responds, if that book got you to prepare this Emancipation Proclamation, then its author should be a saint. That's great. All right. Uh, more questions coming in. Um, 
Let's see. So one of your students, it appears, has already answered this question um, with a resounding yes. But we'd like to get your take on this of uh, tell us about teaching about, at Seton Hall Prep and do the kids enjoy and appreciate Mark Twain? Oh, that's a absolutely wonderful question. I'm going to be realistic. <laughs> it is an honor, privilege and pleasure to teach at the oldest Catholic boys school in the state of New Jersey. I'm going to be realistic about these guys because I don't pull punches. These guys are the best east of the Mississippi, west of the Mississippi and past the Rocky Mountains to California and beyond. These young men want to learn. These are such good young men. And it's a privilege to teach freshman English, junior American literature English. The greatest en enemy of the teacher is time. There's so much to teach and not enough time to teach it. But the guys want to learn. And teaching this Twain course, it is like discovering the toys I asked for from Santa Claus on Christmas morning every day. To be able to share this passion I have for this man, his works, his legacy, his relevance to the world, to show these young men that whether they are rich or poor, old or young, happy or sad, desperate or elated, Mark Twain has already been there. And unlike any other author, with all due respect, he has the words for them to understand what it is they're experiencing. As one young man said, it's like talking to my favorite uncle. He knows I'm in big trouble and he wants me to correct myself, but he already was in the trouble himself. It's okay. And I said to them, and they appreciate, he's more than just a man in a white suit, the white hair with some great one-liners. And we got a diner in Union County named after him. They are amazed at the amount of tragedy that man endured. And like our school motto, hazard set forward. Whatever the obstacle, no matter, we keep on going forward. All the obstacles that happened to Samuel Langhorn Clemens he never gave up. He kept on going like we do. He's a, he is the best example of hazards set forward in second place behind all my students. So I am the luckiest man in the world because I tell the students, if you love what you're doing, you're never going to work a day in your life. And that's what it feels. Granted, it's a ton of preparation. Granted, you're marking papers and sometimes you're looking and saying, what did he say? Okay. All right. <laughs> We'll figure this out. But when a student sees something you didn't, when you're teaching him a new insight, you've done your job. And they're all terrific. That's wonderful. It looks like we have a lot of your students and former students in the audience today. So that's really great. And I did see in the chat um, somebody asking if we could have you come lecture for us every week. And um, I will you know, say to everybody that this is not the last time you'll see John at the Trouble Begin series. He will be back in June. Um, so he's going to be one of our spring lectures as well. So um, we'll release dates and stuff like that for that lecture soon. So I hope all everybody tunes into that. Um, so he will be back. This is not the last time. Um, so it looks like we have a few more questions. Um, it says, we know Artemis Ward had a large influence on Twain's deadpan style humor. Were there other famous lecturers who influences Twain's lecture style? I don't think there was anyone else. I'm not familiar with anyone else. I did my uh, master's in English thesis on Artemis Ward, and I did not find any other lecturers except for Artemis Ward that had such an enormous impression on Mark Twain. We're getting some feedback already about your June lecture, and they say it's that's too long to wait. So, <laughs> I, will um, say, I will say this. Uh, Dr. R. Kent Rasmussen, who wrote Critical Companion to Mark Twain, he once said to me, why don't you write a book on deadpan comedians? And I said, I don't have the time. Why don't you write it and I'll contribute a chapter. But I say to all our audience here, this tradition that Artemis Ward started and Twain certainly continues and through my students continues to this day, I say to everybody, look at Jack Benny. Look at Bob Newhart. And in some ways, Look a little at Bob Hope. Bob Hope wants you to find that one-liner, but you know it's coming. It's deadpan. 
And I think it's just a wonderful hallmark of our American, our American style of humor. Dave Chappelle, he gives great insights, but the humor is there in amongst his words. People wake up and see the world around you. Absolutely. Um, so kind of moving through these quickly so we can get them all in because there's only a couple left. But um, uh, Mike says, I found the misspellings to be humorous, but I understand that they were misspellings. How many people in the mid 19th century were not literate? Was Ward appreciated mostly by the educated in his day? He was appreciated by the educated and uneducated because misspellings were in vogue. So people who couldn't read well appreciated the fact that attention was being drawn to them because they're showing humor on life's incongruities. And you would think, well, you need someone with an education to do that. No, it could be a backwoodsman person who has common sense. It's been said, common sense is our greatest instinct. And sadly, it's our greatest need. He tapped into it when it was, when it was popular. Twain did that a little bit before he became Mark Twain, submitting sketches, but he got past it. And eventually it went out of, it went out of style. Um, Joe asks, uh, did Brown make any money or leave an estate? He's buried in Maine. He made enough money to do this traveling I don't know if he left an estate. I can say that when he was in California, he went to McGuire's Opera House in San Francisco. There was such a rush, the police had to be called to cordon people off. And people were putting gold coins into the usher's hats and the brims were breaking because the gold was falling to the ground. That's how popular he was. He was making money, but I did not read anything that he was wealthy. He was too, unfortunately, he was too busy traveling. He didn't take enough time to take care of himself. Um, so Steve Courtney is just uh, also verifying that in June, you're gonna be talking about uh, Thomas Nast and Mark Twain, correct? They, they shared a very unique friendship and Mark Twain was in the great state of New Jersey 15 times and stayed at Thomas Nast's home in Morristown, New Jersey in 1885 Thanksgiving. Okay, end of spoiler. That's a tease. Everybody's got to come to next year's lecture to get the rest. Yes, absolutely. Um, so it looks like I have one more question in the Q&A and then I have a question for you. Sure. Um, so the question in the Q&A from Sarah says, are any of your school lectures recorded? And if so, where are they posted? Thank you very much for that compliment. No, they are not recorded because I don't like to see myself recorded. I'll probably look at this recording when I'm 85 years old because mm -hmm. we can always we can always be better. And our guys are trained and they train themselves to listen carefully and to take it all in the first time because we've just got too much to say. All right, so my question before we pop back to the newest question that just came in in the Q&A. Um, Steve wrote in the chat that a few years back, a local historian in Nevada took him to the exact spot in Virginia City where Clemens watched Ward give that lecture. Have you ever been there? I have not. As soon as this stupid pandemic is over and done with, I want to go out there. And uh, if everybody wants a thrill, I say put on Elmer Bernstein's magnificent score to the Magnificent Seven and open up roughing it as you go out to the area of the world that Robert Duvall said, no other country has what we have, our American West. That's great. Um, so uh, the last question that we'll answer um, that just came in from James, it says, of all Mark Twain's works, which would you consider your favorite and why? I have not read all his works. I've read some of them. I am always learning. It must be Adventures of Huckleberry Finn. 
If I were on a desert island and I'm told you get to take one book, and Jody, we had spoken about this. My heart says, take the adventures of Tom Sawyer. There's a boy in all of us. There's a girl in all women. But my mind says, take adventures of Huckleberry Finn. The boy must grow into a man. And Dr. Shelley Fisher Fishkin, in her work, Lighting Out for the Territory, quotes the late CBS News correspondent, Charles Corral, who traveled around the country. And he said this to answer this question. You want to understand America. It can be summed up in one proper noun. Huckleberry Finn. That's great. Well, I want to thank uh, the 175 people who registered for this event today. And as many of them are there are in the audience tonight. I want to thank you, John, again, for, for stepping in and being our speaker tonight and all of your support and friendship to the Mark Twain House and Museum. Um, I know we have just met, but I know you've been a longtime friend to us. And so thank you so much for that. And thank you for agreeing to be a speaker in June as well. Um, I know we're all looking forward to that. Um, so a couple last plugs before we sign off for the evening. Uh, first, I want to, again, draw your attention to that support is vital um, button down at the bottom of your screen. So if you've enjoyed tonight and haven't made a donation so far but would like to, uh, please click that button. As I said at the beginning, every dollar, every penny at the moment is really appreciated by us at the Mark Twain House. Um, I also want to invite you back on December 9th. Um, for our next Trouble Begins at 5.30, where we will be talking with uh, Steve Courtney about uh, the paperback version of the Twitchell Letters. So um, that is uh, coming up, and you can register for that by following the link that I just put into the chat. Johnny, um, yes. can I jump in and Absolutely. Say, would it be all right with you if I... Uh, offered extra credit to my guys to jump in for the Trouble Begins lecture series once Absolutely. a month. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yep. We're going to have it once a month, uh, December, January, February, March, April, May, June. Um, so all throughout your guys' semester, there's going to be Trouble Begins. So, and it'll be a really great variety of topics. So boys, sign on in. <laughs> extra credit. And they know I hardly give it all, but this is Mark Twain. <laughs> Extra credit or cigars for everyone. Cigars yep. are healthy. Extra credit. <laughs> there you go. It looks like your students are very enthusiastic about yes. that idea. <laughs> so, um, and the last plug is that if you missed last Friday night and our virtual gala, um, that is also available for replay um, through our uh, Venmo. Um, so I'm going to also put that there in the chat box. So if you missed that, please uh, tune in and watch that. It was a fantastic event and. Um, it, it's worth the watch. So thank you all again. Thank you, John. Thank you to our audience. Thank you to CT Humanities and the Center for Mark Twain Studies for sponsoring the Trouble Begins at 530 events. And I will see you all in December with Steve Courtney. An honor. Thank you, John.